So welcome to Faith for the Climate presents Faith and a Green Recovery, Thinking Global, Acting Local. We are joined by the Right Reverend Dr. Stephen Croft, Bishop of Oxford, the Right Reverend Olivia Graham, Bishop of Reading, and Dr. Jagbir Jupi Johal, uh, Senior Lecturer in Sikh Studies at the University of Birmingham and Trustee of Faith for the Climate. Now, the inspiration for this month's webinar was we know that the Lambeth Conference in the Anglican Communion was supposed to take place this July. And there was going to be quite an ambitious discussion on the climate emergency. And building up to that, there were lots of strides that were being made in this country by the Church of England in its commitment to climate action. Um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, the uh, Lambeth Conference has been postponed to 2022. But we thought this would be a good opportunity to be a placeholder, placeholder event for it and just to highlight all the stuff that's been happening, especially now as we tentatively come out of lockdown. Um, we know that coronavirus is here to stay, but we're thinking about how we can manage it and what this means for the climate. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to talk about what we can all do individually and locally and what kind of global impact that we can make as people of faith. So I'm really excited, first of all, to speak to uh, Bishop Stephen Croft. Now, how this will work is I'll have a bit of a discussion, a Q&A with each speaker, a very brief one, just to introduce you know, their entry point into the issue. And then we'll open it up. I'll ask a few questions that each speaker can take more generally. Um, and then we'll look at your questions in the chat box before we go into breakout rooms. So Stephen, it's really wonderful uh, that you can join us today. Thank well, you. It's really good to be here. <laughs> so um, I mentioned before uh, the advances specifically that the Church of England has made in climate action. I mean, this year was a big year and especially this really ambitious and much lauded, you know, commitment to achieve carbon net zero by 2030. Mm. And, you know, you were someone who was quite pivotal in that campaign. I was wondering if you can tell us a bit about how it came about. Yes, I'm, I'm, I think you're ascribing me credit that's not due, actually, Shannon, but, but um, I, I'm very pleased um, the General Synod uh, in February made the um, decision it did to go for net zero, um, but, but uh, it emerged quite gradually and, sudden, and then suddenly at the end uh, everything came together. Uh, and I think it was a product of the rising tide of environmental concern that we've seen both nationally and globally, uh, and uh, the Church of England, uh, I think, um, uh, I'm very pleased we have made that commitment now, um, uh, uh, but I think it, it, it's come too late. I don't think we were urgent enough, quickly enough, actually. Um, but I think the General Synod decision in February of this year is a real watershed in our national church, uh, and I think uh, we're almost in the situation now of having to think through the impact of that. Uh, 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 net zero by 2030 is a very, very bold commitment in, in the Diocese of Oxford. Uh, we have something like 500 uh, vicarages, homes, that will need to be uh, carbon neutral, uh, schools that will need to think about that, church buildings, transport questions. So for any single diocese, <clears throat> that means there's a whole agenda uh, has, has to get behind that. Uh, but I think these commitments are symbolically very important uh, in terms of setting an agenda and leading the way. But they're only then important if individual dioceses and parishes and the church nationally follows through on those commitments uh, over the next few years, which is the challenge we've now set ourselves. Am I right in thinking that there was some discussion about the date to achieve net zero because it wasn't an earlier version of that 2045 or something what, how yeah, it, it was a really um, significant um, amendment to a proposal that was originally brought for 2045 2045 was um, uh, just slightly ahead of the government's own target of 2050 which is enshrined in legislation and there was clearly a move to say this wasn't a radical and bold enough gesture um, 
2030, when it was passed in February, almost seemed uh, too soon to represent a serious commitment. Uh, and obviously you need a pathway uh, for something that's only in 10 years time. And I think the target has now been set well ahead of the pathway and the commitment. So there's a great deal of ground to be made up in planning for that. Uh, but, but on balance, I would rather have something that was more urgent and made us work harder, because I think that in turn, providing we're able to do that, uh, amplifies our voice with credibility uh, to the government and to the wider country, and also demonstrates to the Anglican communion around the world that we're extremely serious about this and that we're going to make changes in our common life and in our individual lives. Yeah, and when you say, um, you know, and you say it's a motion passed in General Synod, you know, to me that almost sounds, it's like a parliamentary process, isn't mm. it? With negotiations and wording and so on. Yeah. So I wonder if you can paint us a picture of how this actually works. Like at what point did congregations at the grassroots get involved? At what point did it get into the system and become negotiated within the system? What, what did it look like? Uh, we have a national group working on climate change and, and they brought the motion for uh, 2045. Uh, and uh, that was a planned debate, building on several other, other debates that have happened uh, over recent years, some of them effective, some of them less so inevitably. Um, and there was a sense that uh, climate was moving up the church's agenda, uh, and that many people wanted it to be much higher than it was. Uh, and then different dioceses brought in amendments to the motion, which actually set a much sharper and steeper target. So it is quite like a parliamentary process, uh, uh, but because the amendments came in without all the planning, they came in kind of sideways at the last minute. That's why there's an effort to make up ground now. And um, it's thrown the gauntlets down really to individual dioceses to demonstrate then how they will uh, attempt to achieve this target, which we can only do by acting as a whole church. Of course, the motion was only passed in February and in March, the COVID crisis uh, came along and, and has begun to consume available time and energy. So I think in the second half of this year, there needs to be significant return to climate in the national debate as also in the Church of England's debate as to how we're going to take things forward. Um, just one, well, a couple more questions before we move on to Olivia, but were you surprised when the amendment passed? Uh, yeah, yes, I was. I, I, I was actually on sabbatical at the time, so it wasn't at the Synod. And um, uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was surprising because we'd, we'd brought as a diocese amendments uh, and proposals uh, and 18 months previously to challenge the Church of England's continued investment in fossil fuel campaigning. And the General Synod had uh, opted for a, a, a policy of continued engagement with fossil fuel companies rather than withdraw. And there'd been a debate last summer about uh, the resourcing of climate change across dioceses, which again, had not really um, produced any radical outcomes. But I think the rise in public awareness in the intervening period, and the fact that the Lambeth Conference was due to happen, and that sisters and brothers from all over the world will be holding us to account for our stewardship of climate on these issues both help to raise it up the agenda. Mm. Final question before I move to Olivia. Um, you alluded to this, you said, you know, it was very ambitious. It was passed in February before lockdown. And, mm. you know, there was already ground to make up anyway beforehand. And now we are seeing the COVID crisis. Can you say a bit more about that? If you had to evaluate, you know, this ground that needs to be made up now in terms of the ambition, where is um, yeah, I mean, Olivia may say more about this, but but we've been working in the Oxford Diocese uh, with a new initiatives for almost a year now, setting up a working group which had to begin by calibrating what our uh, carbon use is, calculating how much we are using, and developing tools for local churches and energy audits, and then plotting detailed plans towards net, a net zero target from there. Uh, and that work has continued through the year within our own diocese. Uh, uh, but it's demonstrated to us that, that even in a diocese which wants to go further 
and is prepared to resource this significantly, um, there, there is a huge amount of ground still to travel. Some of the impacts of COVID have been helpful, as we all know, to environmental concerns, particularly decreasing our use of transport and making greater use of virtual meetings like this. Uh, and so there'll be some gains through that. But we're aware in Oxford that we have a huge distance still to travel. And we're still at the stage of, I think, calculating the cost of that and the routes to it. But we're as determined as we can be to make good progress. Thank you so much, Bruno. We'll come back for a wider discussion after this. But um, at the moment, I'd like to bring in Olivia right now. Hi, Bishop Olivia. Can you, can you, are you on mute? Are you able to? No, I'm unmuted. Okay. Hi. 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 Um, yeah, I thought it would be nice to just get your perspective on this. Um, but for the non-Anglicans and indeed the non-Christians among us, if you could just explain something, you are the Bishop of Reading, but you work with Oxford Diocese. Can you just explain briefly to us what that means, how that works? Um, I'm, I'm, I think the easiest way of understanding it is that I'm a more junior bishop. Um, uh, if Bishop Stephen is the Bishop of the whole of Oxford Diocese, which consists of three counties, and it's split into four Episcopal areas. Uh, so I'm the Bishop of Reading, which is one of those Episcopal areas. Right, okay. So that was going to be my next question because you know one thing I do know is the unique thing about uh, the Church of England is this idea of linked dioceses. So there will always be a diocese within the Church of England that has a link with a diocese in another part of the Global Anglican Communion. Um, and I was just wondering, I mean, could you share some examples of effective grassroots climate organizing in some of the diocesan links that you're familiar with? Well, in Oxford Diocese, uh, we are fortunate to have uh, three linked dioceses, um, one in the church in Sweden, the Diocese of Vecha, uh, one in the church of South India, the Diocese of Nandial, and one in South Africa, the Diocese of Kimberley and Kuruman. Um, and they're all engaged in climate action uh, or environmental action in various ways. So, uh, for example, the, the church in South India has got the most brilliant uh, environment program, which um, includes uh, 10 green commandments and, uh, and, and that care for creation is built into the CSI constitution, which is fantastic. Um, they've got a flagship green schools program, um, which uh, involves staff, um, students, whole school communities uh, working on uh, environmental issues, sustainability, uh, and combating climate change within their schools. And we've just set up and are about to launch um, a linking, a twinning program between 10 of their schools and 10 of our schools in Oxford Diocese, um, which is going to be amazing, I think. It's, the idea is to provide um, opportunities for mutual learning and uh, uh, exchange ideas and good practice around energy conservation and environmental protection um, uh, and, and learn from each other. So that's fantastic. Um, there's some really good work going on in, um, in Vecha, which is, I'm told, uh, calls itself and is called by others the greenest city in Europe. Um, they've got a very uh, well um, sort of regimented uh, environment program and are doing all sorts of good stuff in, at all sorts of levels uh, of their diocese. Um, in Kimberley and Kuruman, um, there's a lot of, uh, of interesting stuff going on, but interestingly, they don't see uh, the issue just as climate change um, or, or, or carbon, carbon uh, emissions in, in quite the same way that we're quite focused um, in this country on, on, um, on uh, emissions uh, and what that's doing to the, to the environment. Um, in, in Kimberley and Kuruman, uh, they're concerned about uh, sustainability, um, about livelihoods, um, about the degradation of their soil, about drought, extreme temperatures. This is also a huge issue in India. Um, and so they're doing a lot of small scale stuff um, on um, uh, pollution, uh, cleaning up plastics, uh, improving community um, waterways, um, uh, gardens uh, for food. Uh, so all sorts of things around sustainability and general environmental protection. Uh, and of course, um, the, the, the key thing for us uh, is that they are not responsible 
for the emissions which are killing them. Um, we're responsible for them. So there's a massive uh, imbalance of responsibility uh, within um, you know, this relationship, in a sense. Uh, we've had to really learn from that and feel uh, very um, humbled by it and, uh, and repent, really, of, you know, of, of our part in creating the problems that we see there. I think that those stories, you know, those concrete examples are just so powerful and meaningful. Um, I think it really speaks to the topic today as people of faith. How do we act locally, but how do we make those global connections, mm -hmm. right, in terms of climate action? Um, you've, you've touched upon this briefly, but I was wondering for you personally, what are some of the more memorable lessons you have learned in working with these different linked dioceses? Well, I think that um, Bishop Stephen uh, was was a part of this too. In 2017, um, we had a week-long meeting in Kimberley uh, in the Northern Cape of South Africa, bringing together 20 people from that diocese and 20 people from Oxford. And we worked um, extensively together before this meeting on identifying the issues we wanted to grapple with together. An environment came out, uh, you know, very close to the top. So that was one of the key themes of that, that week-long meeting. And it was during that meeting we realised realized, uh, actually all sorts of things, um, that their, their approach was rather different to ours, their concerns were rather different, um, but they all had the same source, which was the degradation of the environment around us. Um, and I think what we learned there was uh, something which I think was a moment of eco-conversion almost for us uh, in Oxford, um, which, was, which was to hear at first hand the impact of climate change on the poorest and most marginalized communities. And I think it really brought home to us that this is a justice issue. Uh, it's a moral and spiritual issue. Um, and that, that really triggered, I think, our own uh, thinking and brought environment right up our agenda and then led to a whole series of uh, meetings and actions which have resulted in our own um, diocesan environment program. Um, so I think, I think eco-conversion is probably not too strong a word for it. It was a, it was a real light bulb kind of uh, moment for us. Yeah, and I think that's really powerful. Just um, again, it's conversion plus kind of on the ground testimony. That's the power of it, just seeing it for yourself, speaking to the people for yourself. Um, thank you so much for that. We'll come back to a, a wider discussion later. I'll bring in Jagbir at the moment, just to have a chat with her. Um, hi, Jagbir. Hi. <laughs> uh, well, let's, let's dive into it. I think um, we left off with Olivia on something quite powerful um, about how these different connections that we have on the ground can create this kind of conversion experience. I was wondering if you, just to start with, if you could give us a snapshot of recent developments in climate action amongst Sikhs in different parts of the world, because Sikhism is all those religions that has lots of diasporic connections around the world as well. So. Yeah, so I suppose, first of all, I think it's important to just kind of hi uh, highlight how Sikhs believe that caring for the environment is essential to being in harmony with God. Um, and if we're thinking about that, um, we have to kind of bring in the notions of seva, selfless service, um, which is a principal motivator, motivation for Sikhs to engage in, say, for example, um, social justice work, but also in terms of protecting the vulnerable. And in this instance, we can talk about protecting the vulnerable in terms of the environment. Um, but the other aspect of it is to be thinking about the concept of Sarbat Dapala, which means the well-being of all. Um, that well-being of all uh, will reflect in terms of economics, but it will also to, uh, um, have an impact with reference to the um, uh, climate around us. Um, in terms of thinking about the activities within the Sikh community, within the diaspora, um, there's a number that I would kind of highlight. Um, way back in um, early, two, in, in 2012, I think it was, in Canada, we had an organization set up there, which was called Karma Grow. 
Um, that was mainly kind of, it had environment within its remit, but it also focused on social justice, inequality, food insecurity. Um, and I suppose what it, it set up uh, like a good farm, a good karma farm, which was to provide food banks with food, right? But through organic means, etc. cetera. Um, and what we saw there was the younger generation, particularly the millennials uh, rising up in the diaspora, recognizing that there is a climate issue and recognizing that things need to be done. And then wearing this hat of social justice that Sikhism teaches us about, um, taking action. Um, another organization that kind of followed on after Karma Grow um, was EcoSeek, um, coming out of the US. Um, and I suppose, again, that is um, another organization which has taken that responsibility um, and recognizing the need to protect the vulnerable uh, in terms of the climate. Um, so what we have seen is a lot of um, new organizations, uh, come, well, not that many, but um, organizations being set up. I suppose in terms of India, where you could think that from Punjab that we would have had a lot more kind of um, activity coming out or people speaking about it, we haven't heard of that. Um, what we did see um, uh, in the, uh, um, uh, before 2000 was uh, the reference to the um, Green Revolution, for example, in Punjab. That led to the depleting in Punjab of underground water levels, um, high pollution rates, which were leading to schools being closed due to smog, where people were burning, say, for example, old rice crop to clear the field for wheat, um, at, um, burning crops double and everything. Um, then we've also seen a growing industrialization, which has led to pollution of rivers, etc. And one of the um, important uh, individuals, I would say, that has come out of Punjab and India, who has focused on the environment is um, a, a religious uh, priest called Sant Babir Singh Situal. And what he did was in 2000, he set about um, cleaning the river bay um, in Punjab um, and talking about how um, the, the river needed to be cleaned. Now, the significance of this river was that was where the first guru of the Sikhs, Guru Nanak, had his enlightenment, where he disappeared and then reappeared. So there was a very kind of religious significance to that. And he's referred to um, as Eco Baba. Um, and he wears orange saffron colored clothes and everything. Very engaged with um, fighting extreme poverty, but also um, embodying within that the whole notion of gender equality as well. Um, so we've seen that. And in terms of that, uh, image being out in the public domain, uh, in the diaspora. I suppose the, um, he was in a Times magazine in, uh, I think it was 2008, where he was defined as the hero of the environment in Punjab. So it was very significant that this activity, as a, a lone individual recruiting people within Punjab to help clean up that river. Um, and I said, and that got him the recognition in, nationally in Punjab and India and everything. Um, so that's uh, something significant. And the other one gentleman I think um, is very significant in the whole debate about climate change and in the environment, in, particularly from India, is um, Bhagat Puran Singh. And he set up an organization, a charitable organization, which looked after the well-being of all, particularly those who were disadvantaged and suffering from illness. Um, and it was called All India Pingalwara uh, Charitable Trust. But within that, while he was looking after the needs of individuals, young people, etc., he was also concerned about the environmental health um, and uh, talking about how the human and the social health um, was all integrally connected and had to be dealt with. Um, so I think um, you saw he wrote quite a lot of pamphlets, which um, my parents had um, at home, like plant or perish, environmental concerns and trees. And then you saw these kinds of activities that he took forward in terms of farming. So set up a farm, which was going to focus on natural farming, planting orchards. Now, um, but you didn't get to hear much about it. 
Um, and I think some of us now who are researching the topic, who are very interested in it, were delving into it and seeing who these individuals were, what they were doing. And um, his successor, Bibi Inderjit Kaur, is a formidable woman. Um, and she's taking his environmental concerns forward and trying to teach within Punjab, for example, the need to um, not destroy the environment, but to learn how to coexist reducing waste and using natural um, uh, things. So it's these kinds of individuals that sometimes think they're lone individuals who are kind of um, bringing about small changes one at a time. Um, but I think uh, while I've mentioned all these, I think one of the uh, organizations, EcoSeek, I think is, good, is the one that's rising in profile. It's, get, it's getting the uh, public uh, limelight and it's, um, uh, getting the message out there. Just in the interest of time, I mean, I think this is a good place for me to start. I was going to, I was going to get all of you to introduce yourselves and your perspectives, but then I wanted to go into some of the more challenging questions. And I think, Jagbir, you're kind of pointing to that now as well. And in some of the points you've raised about Ecobaba and, you know, the millennials that you said that are coming up in Sikh communities around the world. Now, if I were to read this another way, it sounds like is it too strong to say there might be a leadership vacuum um, on climate action where it's, it's these lay members of congregation, younger members and so on, individuals, as you put it, who have to take this on and redefine Sikhi for themselves? Yes, I think um, we have a, a high, high spiritual and temporal body, the Akaltak, within um, India. And they have made announcements, say, for example, like in 2009, um, the religious leader there, Jatadar Gajaran Singh, um, he had said publicly that, um, that the moral and religious duty of each Sikh was to actively care for the environment, right? But there's never been what a kind of, um, like within the church, for example, a, a concrete set of, right, this is what we need to do and this is how we are going to do it. What we've seen more of is this kind of act, social activism from youngsters particularly, in terms of um, through their uh, uh, growing up through, the, say, for example, particularly the Western education, those in the diaspora, learning about the issues of climate change, recognizing what it is. But this is the case, I think, also in Punjab, where people are live, having to live with the pollution and, um, and all that it's causing, the negative uh, aspect of it, um, and then taking the lead on these things. Um, but it's then how do these organizations, like whether it is EcoSeek um, or whether it's Karmaga, how they kind of work together to get the message out there into the Godwaras, etc., and everything. And, uh, and EcoSeek, I think, has been quite good in terms of working with young children um, and then taking their voices into Godwaras. So. Yeah. Thank you. And just to let everyone know, I mean, uh, at Faith for the Climate, we're extremely thrilled that EcoSeek UK is one of the groups that we work with in our yeah. capacity building project for religious minorities, and we can testify to the excellent work that they're doing as well. Yes. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd move on because you brought up this, this comparison with the church. I wonder if Olivia or Stephen had anything to say about that. You know, my kind of cheeky question about a leadership vacuum within religious communities. Yeah, and thank you, Shannon. Happy to comment on that. Um, I think the um, yeah, yes and no, I would say. I, I think the um, leadership given by Pope Francis, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, by the global leaders of the Orthodox Church has been significant at key moments and was especially significant leading up to the Paris uh, climate agreements. Uh, so, so that overall leadership has been there. Um, I think there is far more that could be done. But, but I think... Um, Probably what the faith communities need is, is uh, both humility and confidence. Um, uh, the, the environmental movement is only going to move forward through global partnership. Uh, and therefore, it's not the leadership of any particular section of society. It's partnership among the whole of society. And, and there's a proper humility needed to form those partnerships. No one group and no one faith group or the faith groups altogether are not going to solve this without engaging uh, the political processes and multinational companies and so on. So that's really important. But the faith communities need the confidence to speak into the debate. 
Mm. And that's hard in minority positions, which all faith communities are in uh, within the United Kingdom. I'm a member of the advisory board of something called the Environmental Change Institute in the University of Oxford. And it's an interdisciplinary uh, uh, part of Oxford University, which equips people for leadership in the environmental movement uh, across the world in terms of postgraduate uh, degrees. It's a fantastic uh, enterprise. Um, they have taken very seriously over the last four years I've been part of them, the challenge of engaging faith communities across the world in environmental concerns, because they reckon uh, that globally, the faith communities are in the majority of the human race and the environmental questions are not going to be addressed unless faith communities are engaged from the grassroots yeah. to the very senior leadership. And therefore it's part of the environmental movement as a whole to spread that engagement and encourage that engagement. So we mustn't feel as though we are marginal to the debate either nationally or globally. We must have the confidence to speak but we must have the humility also to recognize it has to be partnerships. Thank you. Olivia, I wonder if you wanted to add anything to that. I entirely agree about the humility and the confidence. And I, I think Bishop Stevens has spoken about the global um, and the sort of higher level leadership um, uh, connections which need to be made and the space to be occupied. I think I just want to say that that, that space exists at all levels of society. So uh, locally here in, in Oxford Diocese, we are trying to work with um, uh, uh, community organising through uh, partnership with Citizens UK. And, and that is involving bringing together all types of uh, civil society organisations, including other faith groups, uh, to, to, into forums in which at a local level, we can surface the issues which are really important to us um, across uh, the Thames Valley, in our case. And climate is coming out as being a really key issue. So I think that, that partnership is the key word here. We, we absolutely have to see ourselves as being part of society, not apart from it. And, and to be um, intentionally working to build connections, relationships, alliances right across the board. Uh, stepping out of our silos um, and working together for the good of humanity, because this is a global uh, issue which affects all of humanity. Thank you. Um, I think those answers are really strong, and I'm I'm just playing devil's advocate now as well, because I but I want I want to push this a bit further because this idea of partnerships. I mean, this is something we try and do in Faith for the Climate as well. That's why our webinars are cross faith, and we accept people of different kinds of religious persuasions, even within the same faith tradition. But at the same time, you know, I'm a Muslim from Malaysia and there's, there's good multi-faith cooperation there, but you see when tensions happen as well, whether between faiths or within the same faith, you know, amongst Muslims, I can cite Sufis and Salafis and so on. Um, and it's always like, it's these hot button political issues that seem to take center stage. So what happens when they do, when you know they dominate the discussion and climate takes the back seat, what do we do then as people of faith if we're interested in making a truly global impact from where we are? Um, I wonder who wanted to start with that. I mean, yeah, anyone. Should I, should I comment uh, there, Sharon? And um, I, I think, I honestly think it's easier to work um, side by side for people of faith on common issues than it is to, as it were, sit opposite each other and share our different traditions. Um, uh, and, and therefore I would see working together on the climate as actually supporting overall uh, uh, relationships within the faith communities. But, but also I think that the global situation tragically is um, taking care of the issue of priorities which you'd raised because if people's eyes are open at all, we realize from the scientific evidence that uh, uh, climate change is already happening disastrously for many communities on the earth. Uh, it's happening seriously for uh, our own country uh, at present. Uh, and that is sadly only going to get worse. So, so the climate itself is moving the climate 
uh, and the environment up the agenda. Uh, and I think all that any of us can do is amplify uh, that voice and that priority and say to our own communities and to other communities, this is the most important question of the age. We have to get involved. We have to put these other things on one side for the sake of the present and the future uh, and the world. And, and I can't see any arguing with that logic because the alternative is disaster for the whole human race. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Stephen. I wonder if Olivia or Zagdir wanted to add to that. So I suppose um, recognizing um, for myself personally um, in this whole kind of um, intra, inter kind of the dialogue and everything, I suppose we've got to recognize that this earth is, uh, in terms of Sikh terminology, Dharamsal, uh, a religious place of worship. This is a sacred place of worship, the earth. Um, and we have a responsibility to protect it. Um, and we are custodians of it. Um, and um, no one faith group has more right over it. We're all equal partners in our responsibility to protect this vulnerable resource that we have. Um, and it's essential that we work together and collaborate um, on protecting um, the environment um, because that is essential if we are going to also tackle the social injustices within this world. Mm. So um, that conversation needs to be had. Sometimes it may be difficult, but it's a common, uh, it's a common issue that is affecting everybody. It's not discriminating against one faith or another. It's affecting all of us. So we've got to unite in terms of how we can um, share best practice, how we can um, share ideas on how to make um, our places of worship eco-friendly, for example, or how we engage with people in policy and politics um, on, on um, trying to curb this um, issue. So I think, yeah, the, um, I think because it's a common issue, it's, it, it cuts across all of humanity and the oneness of humanity, we've all got to work together. Um, there's no ifs or buts about that, I don't think. Mm, thank you. I'm just still wondering though about, you know, the feeling that there are so many fires to fight if you're a person of faith. And if you're a religious minority, say in a part of the world where you are persecuted for some reason or discriminated against, there are so many fires to fight, you know, and it can get really exhausting. But I, I suppose I'll just jump in. But there's small things that we can all do right, J to make an impact. Yes, there are a whole lot, there might be other bigger issues going on, um, conflicts uh, and issues that might affect us. Um, but we personally um, uh, can work together with others just to do, make small little changes where we are to have an impact if we can't engage with the bigger, wider picture. Thank you. Olivia, I wonder if you just had anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm really struck by how in um, Sikhism there's that respect for the uh, for the planet, the earth, and a sense of it, but you know, being sacred. And I think you know, in in the Christian faith, we share that. Uh, we haven't always um, been very faithful to that as a as an idea in, in our practice, but but it's there in our scriptures. Um, but I think the other thing that we need to just uh, remember is that uh, all of those things which um, which can weigh in on uh, us as human communities across the world, uh, gender inequality, uh, um, uh, racism, sectarianism, all of those, those, uh, those evils which, um, which distort our human relationships. Um, they're, they're all born out of the same set of issues which has, which has created climate injustice, which is the sense that one group of people has somehow more entitlement uh, than another in our in our uh, human communities, um, and we know that that women and people of colour bear disproportionately the weight of um, of climate change in our world. Uh, so there's inbuilt injustice, which are connected to some of those issues that you you were also talking about in terms of religious minorities oh. and so on. So I think that, um, and of course, you know, the, our young people are going to inherit the consequences of our inability to deal with this. So it's really crucial that we get this right. But I think that as people of faith across the globe, we need to name this. We need to name this, this evil of a sense of entitlement uh, that we come into the, the debate with. 
um, or or the or form the relationships. If we hold that as as you know something within ourselves, we need to let go of it uh, mm. and try to see everybody uh, uh, across the planet as being equal in the sight of God and uh, and therefore brothers and sisters to each other and therefore sharing a common responsibility for our common home. And the more we teach that and speak it and uh, encourage it and act it out, uh, the stronger that voice will be. Thank you so much. And I think that's that really speaks to something you said earlier about how as people of faith, we, we craft our moral narratives as well that come from a deep place of faith and, and people of all faiths can do that, this narrative of justice, you know, and how everything is interconnected. Um, yeah, and I think that's something we've seen with the debate on climate justice, with George Floyd, with Black Lives Matter. You know, what does it mean I can't breathe? What does it mean to different people and how we can, you know, pull these threads together? I think that's actually a really good place to um, sort of read out some of the questions that have come through the chat box. And um, we'll give this about 10 minutes um, and then we will go into breakout rooms. So the first one is, I'll just read out the question in full and whoever wants to come in can just jump in. Uh, the value of shares in Shell has fallen by 40% since the start of the year and they have cut their dividend by two thirds, their first dividend cut since the Second World War. Has the Church of England left it till too late to get out of fossil fuel shares? Does it still make sense for them to engage? I think this is probably a question for Stephen first, isn't it? I thought it might be. Uh, thank you very much, you, for the question. Um, I, I think I, I'm not um, uh, able to answer the question in relation to uh, Shell, though I think that's a worrying sign. I think there are three dimensions to the divestment question, and Hugh's question uh, illustrates them very well. The first is the economic argument that's put forward for divestment, that uh, fossil fuels will soon not be a very good place to invest because the world isn't using them anymore. Um, the second is the balancing of influence. Can we exert more influence by withdrawing uh, and showing uh, objections to this than we can by engaging? And the Church of England has so far put the weight on engagement and uh, I think all parties would agree, certainly I would affirm the fantastic work the engagement unit has, has done. And the third is this simple ethical equation that do I want, as part of the Church of England, my own church to profit from investment in fossil fuels at this particular juncture in time? And my personal answer to that is no. Uh, I think the ethical argument is the strongest one for withdrawing. But of course, we need to continue to debate the economic argument and the balancing of influence arguments as well. Okay. Thank you. I'll move to the next question now. Um, <laughs> it might be one for you as well, Stephen. It's very brave of the Bishop of Oxford to admit that the church may have acted too late. Kudos to the Bishop. Although he was pleasantly surprised at the 2030 decarbonization motion, does he think that this is achievable? And what does the church need to do to ensure that it meets this target? Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think the goal of big visions and goals is sometimes not so much that they're achievable, but they, they set certain things in motion, which means you reach the target earlier than you would otherwise. So I think unquestionably the 2030 net zero target is a good thing because it spurs us to action. I think uh, it is achievable depending on how you balance uh, and calculate net zero, but in order to move towards it, every single diocese needs to be engaging with this as a top level priority and resourcing it well. And the church nationally needs to be doing the same because we won't get there. The change, the change we need to make is so enormous that we won't get there until we make that quality of investment. I, I hope we will. I see every sign uh, to be encouraged by the national church and good things happening in many dioceses but I'm also aware that the COVID crisis is going to bring its own financial challenges for the church and that will make environmental engagement more difficult still. Thank you. Um, I will try and get through as many questions as possible. Apologies in advance if I can't get through everything, but I think this next one is probably something for 
all three of you or any one of you who wants to answer this. So again, I'll read it out. What can leaders of faith groups do to influence our national government's policies to promote a green recovery and not just spend and rebuild without regard to environmental consequences? There's a follow up. Are there any green doors in quotes to push on and any potential green activists who might be influential in parliament? Um, yeah, it's, it's an open question to all three of you. Who wants to go first? Even may want to talk about, um, about parliament, uh, but, but I, I just like to comment that, um, that, that people of, again to say that, that people of faith have to be working uh, with everybody else. We, we've got, we can't do this alone. We can't do this in silos. It's an issue for our common humanity. It's an issue for our nation, for our world. And so we have to consciously work at getting out of our silos, bringing the resources of our traditions and our faith and our wisdom and, our, and the particular thing we have to offer, which is our spirituality, into the discussions and to enrich them but uh, to, to make sure that we're working together with others. And um, uh, I'm aware that within um, the, uh, the churches, the Church of England has got an environmental network. Uh, there's a, a, a ecumenical environmental network. There's, you know, uh, um, this, own, this, uh, this organization where we're uh, on this webinar with now. Uh, so there's lots and lots of ways in which uh, we are working together um, as faith communities, but we've got to get out of even the faith box uh, and work more broadly across civil society to, to have the voice and the impact. Thank you. Uh, Stephen or Jagbir, do you want to add to that? Up to you, Jagbir. Okay, so I, I was thinking, um, has faith communities, um, and particularly with the Sikh notion of service, self um, serve um, that's very important in our, in our guide, um, in guiding us on how to deal with and address the issue of climate change, but also how to engage with government. Um, we also have a concept called Miri Piri, which is that we have to live within the world, but we've got to take, um, we've got to recognize the spiritual and the temporal responsibility that we have. Um, and within that, I suppose the economics comes into it. But how do we create an environment, a world where um, we don't become exploitative. We work together to address economic needs. Um, and how can faith, for example, now coming out of COVID and all we're hearing at the moment in the news is about job losses, et cetera, uh, and government wanting to restart um, in the economy. But how do we do that together in um, a caring, but also um, a manner which will bring everybody along with it uh, uh, and I think that's one of the most important things I think this pandemic has taught us, that we've got to all work together. Um, we can't just say we'll leave it to that individual to deal with, but we've got to have those conversations. And sometimes those conversations are going to be hard, but we have to recognise um, that we have to have them. And I think faith has an important role to play in how we move out of this um, issue and how we address um, the economic fallout, but also uh, um, so that as we move forward, we do take the environment and the climate into account. Thank you. Um, Stephen. And Thank you. If I could comment on the parliamentary uh, stuff, I'm one of um, 26 Church of England bishops who's privileged to sit in the House of Lords. Um, so so um, uh, the position in the Lords at the moment is really encouraging, actually, uh, in terms of the profile of environmental matters rising up uh, the, um, the community in the House of Lords. Uh, a new organization called Peers for the Planet, P4P, uh, was formed uh, in the autumn, which is a coordinating group. And that's been extremely active. Um, uh, and pulling together, it, it sends me an email uh, every week uh, telling me of seminars coming up. It's educating members of the House of Lords on environmental issues. It tells me what's coming up in terms of the agriculture bill, the environmental bill, the chancellor's statements on the economy. Uh, it sponsored a debate a few weeks ago on the clean green economic rebuild that's needed and is really, really holding the government to account. And I hope we'll do so in other ways uh, over the coming months. So, so I, I'm very encouraged by that. So there are lots of people of goodwill 
in the House of Lords and indeed in the Commons. Uh, one of the organisations I've been part of over the years is, is called Hope for the Future, uh, which, is, uh, 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 which started when I was Bishop of Sheffield and I'm still a patron. It helps equip, especially people of faith, to lobby their members of parliament uh, on environmental issues. And uh, I would really commend it to your networks as well. Uh, I think it's helped a, a lot of people carry this to their MP. And every letter, every meeting, every lobby of parliament raises this higher up the agenda uh, for the future. I, I think the government's made some, some good encouraging moves over the last few weeks. It's talking the talk of a clean green recovery. It's putting some investment into that. Nothing like as much as other European countries as yet, and nothing like as much as is needed. So it needs to continue to be pressed. But, but the rhetoric is there, which is always a good beginning. Thank you. And uh, just to mention, yes, hope for the future. Um, they're a wonderful partner. We work with them a lot. And just to give them a shout out, I mean, they've run workshops for us as well. But this week, they also have a series of webinars called Faith in the Climate. Um, and if you're not completely fatigued by webinars, there's one this afternoon at four o'clock and there's one tomorrow as well. So, you know, ha have a look at Faith uh, Hope for the Future's webinars also. Um, I'm tempted to just ask one more very brief question before we go into breakout room. So if, if each of you could just give a really brief answer, one line to this question. What image symbolizes climate justice for you? What image symbolizes climate justice for you? Shall I come in? Yeah. Um, I think for me, it's the image of a mother and child uh, because it's an image of vulnerability and tenderness uh, um, and fragility, but also of tremendous hope. Thank you, that's wonderful. Um, uh, for, for me, it, it's the desert and, and a saying of Pope Benedict about uh, uh, the desertific desertification of the world. Uh, there are so many deserts, or the deserts in the world are growing because the inner deserts are so vast and it's a connecting together of spirituality and environmental disaster. Wow. And I also think there's something really rich in there because some of the spiritual answers you find is when you go into the desert. desert. Mm. But, okay, we'll, we'll leave that. That's another topic. But Jagbir, do you have an image of climate justice? So um, it's not an image, but it's an image that makes me think about um, the importance of nature, but also the importance of conversation. And I suppose it's a, a, a common image of Guru Nanak, our first um, guru, um, sitting with um, his uh, two compatriots, um, uh, Bhai Mardana Ji um, and Bhai Bala Ji. Um, they're always seen kind of sitting under a tree with nature around them. Two followers from two different faiths, they have their different conversations, but there's the mutual conversation and uh, respect. That's the kind of guiding um, uh, image that I get in terms of um, how we debate or how we engage on issues, but also the importance of nature. Um, so that's the image that I always remember and think about. And that's beautiful. Thank you, everyone. That's been a really rich discussion. We've covered so much ground. And we went into some challenging areas as well and came up with even more inspirational answers. 